Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Oklahoma Football Live. I'm your host, Jason Ray. Uh, wanted to talk to everyone a little bit about um, the news today. Lincoln Riley made his uh, – he had a – so this didn't come specifically from, from Lincoln Riley, but he had a – a little bit of a press conference as he usually does through, throughout the fall on Tuesdays and talked about talked about the team overall. But I think the one thing that he did not say, which was telling, which has been really reported by Sooner Scoop, Kerry Murdoch, is that Marcus Major um, is, is not going to be academically eligible this season. So, um, so we'll talk a little bit about that, what it means for, you know, kind of overall for the trajectory of this season you know, what it means for next year, and, and it kind of shows you exactly why uh, DeMarco Murray's been so busy on the recruiting trail and, you know, really kind of how Oklahoma got to this point. Certainly we'll talk talked a lot about fall camp. There's a lot of good updates to talk about. So uh, w- within the team just in general, and not just this news, but I know that this is really kind of near and dear to um, a lot of people's heart really talking about um, – talking about Marcus Major and specifically this Oklahoma team as it relates um, to the Sooners this year. So as as I mentioned, um, you know, those of you that have seen me before, my name is Jason Ray. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at just Jason at Jason Ray one. Um, other, other than working with Mark, you know, every week doing these podcasts and, and talking through this, uh, you can find a lot of my stuff, you know, covering Oklahoma and covering kind of the national college football scene. Uh, last word on sports.com backslash college football. We'll, so we'll talk a little bit, a little bit about everything. We got you covered in case you're not just an Oklahoma fan. Uh, we got you covered on the national scene, you know, whether it's Ohio State, we've got Clemson, we've got Alabama, we've got a Georgia rider, we've got Ohio. So we've got the whole national scene cover. So not only for your um, to, to, to get into the Oklahoma football side of things, we've got some uh, specific things that, you know, overall across the country. So so really kind of looking at the Marcus Major um, information. So this is something that we've talked about on our channel here for the last couple of weeks, couple, two or three weeks as, you know, something that was a little bit of a rumor that could, um, that, that could happen, not necessarily set in stone, but, you know, all signs were pointing to the possibility of, of Marcus Major being lost. So initially, initially what I thought was that this could be something that he was not available for, uh, the Tulane game and, and maybe the Western Carolina game, but you know, as uh, Sooner Scoop has reported, that it is he is out for the entire um, the entirety of the 2021 season. So um, remains to be seen. So I look for some sort of release from from either Riley or the University of Oklahoma, just in general, at some point over the co- upcoming days. So um, really wanted to get everyone's view and then talk about my. Um, me personally and my perspective on exactly you know what this means for um for oklahoma so so certainly i think you, you've got eric gray and kennedy brooks in some manner and, and kind of one two in the pecking order of of the running back depth chart up, up to this point i think you know looking at eric gray he's a guy that really came in in the spring and really impressed um everybody lincoln riley demarco murray and has done nothing but just kind of solidify that in the fall practice, um, Kennedy Brooks, you know, coming off from that from that opt out year in in 2020, was you know a little bit rusty, and you could tell that early on. But everything that I've heard and seen is that he has had an incredible summer. He's back to what we you know watching him in, in 20, 2019, 2018, the back to back thousand yard seasons would expect. So. So I so I think you've got a really solid one-two punch there with Kennedy Brooks and Eric Gray. You know, whoever you see starting, I, I from everything I've heard, I think Eric Gray is probably the guy that comes out with a one, but that's really a one A one B. So I wouldn't get hung up too much on exactly who starts. I, I think both of those guys are going to get pretty equal playing time, equal snaps, and I think kind of based on the package that they have, time score situation as well. Um, and Cavantre Bradford is, is a guy that came in late, but, you know, everything that, you know, everything that I'm hearing is a guy that has, you know, played extremely well, kind of getting, getting up to speed with the playbook, and, you know, exactly what Oklahoma is doing and exactly, you know, how he fits into the scheme. But I think 
he's a guy that has a different skill set than than anybody that they've had in the running back room. Um, you know, specifically over the last couple of years, but definitely this year, he's more of a home run threat guy than probably Eric Gray or Kennedy Brooks are. Not to say that they can, certainly can't do that, but you know, I think he's um, you know probably a little bit more electric with the ball in his hands. Um, you know, a little bit shiftier. Uh, has strength, you know, from a strength perspective, might be a little bit stronger than than both of those two. So, so I think he's a guy, you know, honestly, that I think has probably earned, you know, regardless of if Marcus Major would, would be there or not, based on the way that he's played over the last couple of scrimmages and through fall camp specifically, I think he's a guy that probably had earned that number three spot, you know, as of right now, but certainly this solidifies that. So, what does that mean depth wise going forward past that, um, you know, past that number three spot? Because, you know, in, in a given season, you know, look at last year, for for example, how many of those running backs Oklahoma was shuffling in and out of the lineup, you know, through the, you know, through the season, um, you know, early on in the season and then, you know, what it looked like towards the end of the season. So, I um, think this was a position of strength from a depth perspective that um, that Oklahoma had early on in the season, and I think it's gone to probably the biggest question mark depth wise. So, so you know, looking at that, I think you can you can look at numbers one through three, and, and they're as solid as any group in the country. I, I feel feel strongly saying that that you know. Any of those three guys can go win you a championship. Um, however, you know if injuries happen, if you know suspensions happen, we all know what's happened the last few years within that running back room. What does Oklahoma do if they need to have another guy? Well, you know I think initially you could look at you could look at moving Jeremiah Hall there, not not in, in just, not necessarily moving him there, but have them have him there from a depth perspective. If you know one of those guys go down, um, so that's that's one school of thought. The other, the other thought is they got a couple of, couple of um, walk-ons that they're they're going to have to step up and they're going to have to be relied upon to, uh, to to, provide some depth at times if needed. Jaden Knowles and Todd Hudson are two guys, you know specifically that come to mind as you know got Jaden Knowles played really well in the spring game. All, I know it's a spring game versus you know live action, so. Um, but that's another guy. Todd Hudson's been around the program for a while as well. Both of those guys know the offense. I think that's the good thing, right? That that both of those kids know the offense and know exactly, you know, how the offense is ran, what Lincoln Riley expects out of his running back room. Um, so I think that's one thing. But however, they're they are walk ons for a reason, certainly. So so I think, you know, and I think the other thought process would be is there anybody from the wide receiver room? that could potentially provide some depth. I know, you know, the initial one of the one of the thoughts could be, you know, is is a Billy Bowman a guy that, you know, if they possibly um, w- would need to have some depth there, is he a guy that they possibly could use in terms of, you know, his his elusiveness. He's a guy that probably will return kicks for Oklahoma and is right there at the nickel spot. So um so those are a couple of, of ideas. I, I think, you know, I think you'll probably look at Jeremiah Hall as the number one option there if there's some depth issues that, that kind of, you know, creep in. But certainly not a time to panic uh, for Oklahoma fans. I, I think it's it's unfortunate because I think, you know, in this day and age, it's hard to it's hard to understand how a kid could could make himself be. Uh, make himself ineligible you know i think you know with all the tutors and with all the support that that specifically comes from a university like oklahoma it's it's very very strange and very kind of confusing to see how um how a kid could, could get to this point it almost points to very much a very lack of effort of course i don't know the situation so i'm not going to comment too much on on that side of it but um so the sky's not falling by any means, but I think this probably brings me kind of coming into the season as the, you know, as, as my number one concern, um, you know, looking, looking at from a depth perspective only. Um, so Jim, welcome to the, uh, welcome to the program. Thanks for, thanks for your question. Are they looking at the transfer portal? Given the fact that this just came out, it's a little too soon 
to answer. And given the fact that we're so close to the season, I think it's 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 hard. It'd be hard for them to to go into the transfer portal because you know it, it's just you know we're about a week and a half away. You know, being on being on Tuesday, you know, a little bit more than a week and a half, but you know, a week and a half from to when games actually start, and the fact that the fact that Oklahoma doesn't have anyone, you know targeted or this just was announced you know today i don't think transfer portal is probably an option they're probably going to have to go with who they have i mean you know certainly if there's someone that 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 they think that's a maybe a kind of a plug and play guy that could just provide some depth in an emergency situation that that might be something that they look at but i think at this point for someone to be eligible immediately it would have to be a grad transfer of, of some kind so um, I think if they do, it would have to be a grad transfer. Other than that, I think they'll rely on a combination of Jeremiah Hall, combination of their, um, you know, their walk-on. So that gives you three additional guys in the case of any kind of an emergency with, you know, with Eric Gray, with uh, Kenny Brooks, and um, Trey Bradford as well. But I think they're solid with those three guys. Now, the depth is is the one thing to be um, to be concerned about. So, um, thanks for the question, Jim. Um, Broad dude, um, sorry if, if 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 you guys didn't get a notification, please let me know. We'll, I'll make sure to look at that and see why that didn't happen. If the notification did not um, did not happen, however, good a good opportunity right here to to say hey, if if you're um, if you're following the channel, appreciate the follow. Make sure you hit the like and subscribe button so you do uh, so you do get the notifications anytime we go live. Uh, typically, we'll do what we've done in the past is, is, is we've had a live show on Friday. Um, given the fact that we're close to the season, we'll have a pregame show on Saturdays, and then we'll have a postgame show um, pretty much immediately following the game. I'm actually going to – we'll be attending the, the Tulane game in person, so the, the postgame show for the first game of the year might be a little bit um, later, maybe an hour or so after the, after the game it kicks off uh, or after the game is over obviously and then um before that you know i think we'll probably go um maybe three hours before the game start we'll do our pregame for about an hour and a half maybe a couple hours before and just and just kind of talk through some of the keys and stuff so you want to make sure that you like and subscribe and, and get that notification if if there's some if there's some news throughout the season that is warranted for us to kind of go live um to go live and we'll certainly do that something like this and then we've got a, there's, a, there's a bunch of fall camp talk as well um jamar kane went and, and and talked to the media today as well as dennis simmons outside of lincoln riley as well ali c welcome to the welcome to the podcast here thanks for joining um figured it wouldn't was i figured it was going to be marcus major's year um, do you think many times those walk-ons? Yeah, so I think that's an option that Oklahoma certainly will will pursue. I think the the walk-ons and Jeremiah Hall are, are the are the three guys. Not sure what that pecking order will be, Allie. Um, I, I think a lot of it kind of de- depends on the game, depends on the situation. If it's a, you know, if it's just if it's just like maybe a in a game or two where you're you know your top three is out, maybe you. You, you plug and play those, those walk-ons, um, either one of those, whether it be, you know, Jaden Knowles or, or Todd Hudson. I think Jaden Knowles, you know, from from my perspective, is probably the, the guy that's that's first, um, is most ready in terms of how much he played, you know, in the spring game. But um, all three guys, three of those guys, I think, Ali, will, will get a look and, and to see uh, to see what that looks like if that, um, you know, if, you know, God willing, the, the, no, no, one, no one gets hurt, no one. You know, no injuries, no suspensions, no um, no COVID-related things. However, you know, if it happens, and, and you know, you got to think at some point in the season they'll they'll need a little bit of bench strength there. You know, outside of that top three, then then that comes to play absolutely. Um, so what else is um, what else is there to, to to talk through? So Lincoln Riley talked a lot about uh, today. Just kind of gave an overview of of where Oklahoma is. Um, from a fall camp perspective, they just completed their second major scrimmage of the um, of the fall camp season on Saturday. About a ninety play scrimmage, from from what I've from what I've been told and what I've heard, uh, just kind of going up and down the up and down the roster. I think one of the things that's kind of been the been the tone of these first two scrimmages is the offensive offense has started off fairly fast, and I think the the defense has responded very well. Um, 
lately. Uh, so I so I think you know looking at Spencer Rattler, I think he's a guy obviously obviously that we know what he has, and I think there's a couple of things that he has. You know, I think he's brought to the table this year that Lincoln Riley had had to look for him. Quicker decisions. He's much quicker um, in terms of understanding the offense and where where his first, second, third progression is and really making those decisions a little bit quicker. Um, he has a, a, a much better command of the offense from from what we're what we're told. You know, I think that we've seen a lot of times that he, he he'll tend to kind of when he when he releases or when he has trouble he has a tendency to throw off his back foot a little bit and kind of dip back a little bit so i think riley talked a little bit about that in terms of that still being um still being the case still happening from time to time but i think he's much better much more crisp and everything that you know he's he's, he's on target um you know his uh, accuracy was never really a never really anything that kind of came into question last year. It was really more so his decision-making at times. So I think you're going to see a, a, a the guy that you saw the last six games of the year, and then certainly that will um, that will go forward um, as, as well as we, as we go through um, through the season. Um, running backs look good. Like I said, Eric Gray and, and Kennedy Brooks were, were there. Um, I think everything that, I, that I've heard is Trey Bradford played extremely well, which is very – um, very exciting to hear based on, you know, the news that we had today. Um, so wide receivers are playing well, no drops at all. From what I heard, Tra- Travon West is a guy that's really kind of played really well. You know, he had, he was out last year. He's came, come back. Um, so, so I think that that's positive. I think they're one – one of the things that I took away from some of the commentary today was it was Lincoln Riley talked about the offensive line, said – Felt like that they were better, you know, talent-wise than they've been in the last couple of years. So, I think that's um, that's very encouraging to hear because I think that's one of the concerns, um, you know, that that Oklahoma had coming into the season. So I think they got a solid seven or eight guys that they're comfortable with that they could play, um, you know, given given where they're at. And I think the one good thing that that we've seen over the past three years is, you know, the offensive line probably was ahead of the defensive line to a certain extent from a talent perspective. That's not necessarily the case anymore, given the influx of talent that Alex Grinch has been able to, to, to bring into the, um, to the defensive room. So, so that talent is a lot more even than, than what it were, what it was, um, you know, the last few years. So I think that makes that competition a little bit stronger and, um, you know, makes makes the scrimmages and practice much more competitive than maybe they have in the past. Um, so, Hannah, thanks for the next question. Um, will this cause OU to pass more since they will be left? I don't think initially, Hannah. I mean, I don't. Th- I don't think that Oklahoma will will change from a game plan perspective. Of course, the game plan will be game by game based on what the defense is giving them, obviously. So, I, I don't think um, I, I don't think this will change a strategy as of yet. However, having said that, if if we do see some injuries and you know maybe the the play isn't as strong, you know, from a depth perspective, that certainly could be the case. Um, they could rely on the offensive line in the past game a little bit more and the, and the wide receivers, but I, I don't think it's anything right now to to worry about in terms of Oklahoma really kind of changing that that game plan. And, and Riley's talked about they're a run first team. You know, they they've always been that way. They've maybe struggled a little bit last year early on in the season, <clears throat> running the ball as effective as effectively as they need to. But um, you know, having said that, they have been um, they have been been a team that has really um, relied on the running game um, over the over the last few years. And I, I don't see that changing at all this year, um, at all. Uh, Jennifer, yeah, knowing this is Oklahoma's years, it, it's it's hard to understand right now how. Um, honestly how you can how you can be ineligible and certainly there's there's some factors in there that i i don't know and and maybe sh- and probably will never know that never come to light but given the the tutor availability given the just the help that all of these kids get it's it's hard to it's hard to conceptualize and you know kind of understand how you know how a kid could get um could become Ill- ineligible especially given the fact that they're he's ineligible for the entire season so that's um it's disheartening and i think you know and who knows maybe he's a kid that knew he was closer to fourth team than he was actually playing and 
and um, you know he he was discouraged, and that's what caused him to you know. So don't know anything about it, but I think it, it's certainly um, it, it's certainly unfortunate um, that he's you know really landed himself in that position as well. Um, so Hannah coming strong with a good with a good question. So really, I think I'm glad that you mentioned Caleb Williams. So he's a guy that I had heard really extensively um, being talked about by, by a lot of people and just how incredibly impressive that, that he is. And, and, you know, he's approaching every day as if the, this is still an open competition. And, and we all know that this is, this is Spencer Rattler's job, but I think more so than maybe to your point, since the 2017 season, Oklahoma's very comfortable should something happen to to Spencer Rattler on Caleb Williams running this team. Um, I think his elusiveness and his he's a true dual threat who is just as strong, you know, running the ball as he is passing the ball. Um, we saw in, in the spring game, I know it's a little bit different since they're not tackling the quarterbacks, but just saw that dual threat ability that he has. He ran the team very well. Was probably the most impressive guy in the, in the spring game for Oklahoma. So, so yeah, I think, I think you could see some packages for him, especially as we get into crunch time later in the season um, for him to get in, into the game and, and play a little bit for, for Oklahoma this year. He'll certainly play in the four games. I think they'll get him as much playing time as they possibly can, you know, whether it's mop up duty or whether it's um, in a situation in packages um, specifically just to take advantage of his skill set. But a guy that's been really impressive in the fact that, you know, he brings it every single day, every single practice. And, you know, he's a, he's a guy that, you know, wants to be better and, and has a burning desire to, to play as quickly as he possibly can. Uh, so talk about the D line and the O line. So I, I think, I think what we've seen, Allie, early on, you know, through fall camp, is we're seeing a lot of back and forth between between both. I think you've seen the O line, you know, take some strides, and then I think you've seen the D line really just attack them and, and really just be um, be the D line that I think a lot of us coming into the season were were thinking and hoping that you would see. Um, you would see out of Oklahoma. You know, I, I, I think a lot of people inside the program think that this has a chance to be a very elite um, defensive line, if not the best in the country, maybe a top five uh, defensive line in the country. So so I think for that, that you would expect a little bit of give and take, I think, with, with the fact that the Oklahoma defensive line is probably the strongest unit of the team overall, not just on the defensive side of the ball. And, and the offensive line has a, has a few new kids in there. You know, Andrew Raym is working at center. Um, certainly he's played a little bit for Oklahoma, but he's not a guy that has played that position. So he's getting in there. He's learning. Um, and then, you know, you've got Wanya Morris on, on the end who, who's played, and you've got um, Anton Harrison as well. So there's, a lot of, so there's a lot of guys that certainly have played a lot, but maybe not – at the level, I mean, when you look at Oklahoma's defensive line, they're, they're probably about 10 to 12, maybe even 14 deep um, across that defensive line. So that they have the ability to throw a lot more bodies there and be a little bit fresher than maybe the offensive line has. So I, I wouldn't necessarily say the offensive line was having an off day. Um, I think each each side has had the opportunity to, um, to get better. And I think from, you know, Ali, from a lot of the things that I've heard, and seen through some of the practice reports and, and some of the intel that I've I've been able to get, I think the 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 perspective of the offensive line right now is let's see let's see what this looks like against an, another team. Let's see what this looks like outside of going against one of the best defensive lines that we think coming in of the country in the, in the country, and you know look at that against another team and see what that looks like. So I think that will be very intriguing to see. Um, when you um, when you see Oklahoma line up against Tulane, and I, and I think um, you know as this obviously as the season goes forward and and, and that competition gets a little bit um, stiffer for for the Sooners. Um, broad dude, thanks for the question. How are we set for tight end other than Stogner for this season? So I think um, Brayden Willis is the guy um, that has had an excellent 
fall camp. And I, and I think if you, if you talk to talking to some of the coaches and, and reading some of the, um, from, from the media, I, I think Braden Willis is a guy that might have had the best camp maybe of anybody on the offensive side of the ball. So I, I think, you know, looking at him, um, Brought, I think he's a guy that will will get a lot of playing time with Stogner this year, um, and a lot of it depends on the on the package. You know, Jeremiah Hall is the H back, but he can certainly play um, kind of in that tight end type of role uh, for Oklahoma. Um, and, and another guy to look out for, he played, he had a really good spring game. Jackson Sumlin, um, you know, is a guy that could could play play a lot in terms of. Um, really just kind of in terms of depth at that position. But I think he's a guy that you could see get on the field um, as well. Yeah, no, it's, it's kind of funny, Allie, and just overall for the, for the group that's here with us, uh, 33 people on the line. Yeah. So keep the questions coming and um, share, like subscribe and, and get this out there. So a lot of people can join us. I'd love to get in a position where we have over a hundred people that were on online talking Oklahoma football. That's um, really exciting for, for, just a week and a half away and just a mere days, a few days away from week zero getting started. That's exciting. Oklahoma will get a chance to look at, and we'll do some live stuff on Saturday, probably around, you know, 10 or 11 to um, around 10 or 11 to kind of talk through, um, you know, pregame and, you know, look at some of the, some of the games of the day and just talk about anything that you guys want to talk about. Um, so, but yeah, the depth at D line, it's the deepest position I think on the team. You know, I think you've got a legitimate um, opportunity inside. You've got about eight guys that could possibly play. I think when you talk about the defensive ends, you got another four, um, maybe even six guys that, that might be in that regular rotation. You know, Grinch had, had talked about there's upwards of about 14 guys that they feel comfortable with that they could play on the defensive line from a rotation perspective. I'm not sure if they'll get, um, you know, if, if they'll get to – playing full all 14 but i think th there's a lot of guys there um when you look at the defensive lines certainly i think we will we'll probably start with a uh, perry on winfrey and jalen redmond as the as your two guys but then you got jordan kelly you got isaiah co you've got Corey robertson um you've got um you know you've got josh ellison i know i'm missing some here um but you've got a lot of guys internally there um, you know, from a defensive end perspective, you got Marcus Stripling, you got Reggie Grimes, you got Nick Benito, um, you've got um, you know, you've got the new Clayton kid, the the, the freshman um, who who will get some playing time as well. So, so yeah, I think they're I think they've got a lot of depth there, and I think one of the things that's interesting is they were they've been working Caleb Kelly both at inside and outside linebacker. So, um, so that'll be that'll be something to keep an eye on. You know, a little bit of a um, nugget that we got today uh, with with him working outside as well. So that'll be, I think that'll be fun to see how they move some of these linebackers around uh, as well. Ethan Downs is another guy that Jamar Kane talked about, you know, that has, has really showed out and has had a really good fall camp. Um, you know, kind of when you look at the linebacker position, you know, I keep hearing um, Danny Stetsman's name over and over and over again, who's a guy that he's absolutely going to play Honestly, with with as as much as I've heard, I wouldn't be incredibly surprised if he even started. I know they've got a lot of talent inside. When you look at um, when you look at David Aguebu, when you look at Deshaun White, when you look at Brian Osamoa, I, I think um, I think those are those are some guys um, you know that that have played you know certainly played for Oklahoma over the last couple of years. So um, so I think it's it's going to be interesting to see. Um, to see exactly what that, you know, what that two or three deep looks like at the, in the in, inside linebacker position as well. Let's see. So Patrick saw your, um, saw your question about Harrington. And I think Patrick, when you look at, when you look at the defensive backs, I'm not, I'm not sure that Harrington's not one of the top 11 players overall on this, on this roster, on this defensive team. But so I think it'll be interesting to see where the cornerbacks, how which cornerbacks separate themselves um, here for Oklahoma. I, I think you've got about four or five that are certainly going to play, right? You've got, um, you know, and, and I, I kind of 
hesitate to see who I think is going to be the starter because I think com- kind of coming in, I had thought, you know, we would probably see a DJ Graham and a Woody Washington probably be your first two corners. Not saying that that's not going to be the case, but wouldn't be surprised to see some combination of DJ Graham and um, <clears throat> and uh, Harrington as, as your starters. You know, could see Woody Washington and Harrington as your starters. You know, you got Jaden Davis there that's going to be in the mix. You got Latrell McCutcheon uh, that's going to be in the mix as well. So, so I think you've got a lot of depth there at the cornerback position. And you know, everything I've heard, no one's really separated themselves. So, and I don't necessarily think that's a bad sign. I just think that. The influx and in talent um, that Oklahoma has had in the secondary is, um, you know, is really impressive, and 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 really, it's it's not what you what you have seen in the past. So I think Oklahoma um, has that, you know, really has that opportunity to uh, to be much better, <clears throat> excuse me, on the back end than they have in the past. So thanks, Patrick, for that for that question. Um, Really kind of piggyback on that in terms of talking about the safeties a little bit. We talked a little bit about the cornerbacks. I think <sighs> Key Lawrence is, a, is an interesting guy. From from what I've heard, he's a guy that bring, when he when he's ready, when he brings it, um, he's one of the best players on the, on the defense, bar bar none, whatever position you're even thinking about. And and so, but the problem is, I think he doesn't always necessarily bring it consistently every single game. I think from a talent athletic athletic pr- perspective, he's the best. Um, he's probably the best safety. Um, certainly, certainly from a um, in terms of that that battle that he has with with Pat Fields, I, I think Pat Fields, you know, he brings a lot of leadership to the team. He brings a lot of experience, but I think Key Lawrence has a, has a higher ceiling. So I wouldn't at all, you know, Jeremy, be surprised to see um, Pat Fields maybe start early on in the season to lean Western Carolina early, but Key Lawrence get a lot of playing time, and then eventually see see Lawrence take that take that job over. Um, you know, when you look at the other safety position, position, I think Delaire and Turner Yale has that one knocked down. I think Oklahoma would like to see. Um, so I think whoever doesn't start, whether it be Pat Fields or um, Key Lawrence at that other position, will be kind of a swing guy at both the strong and the free uh, for Oklahoma going into the year. But but I think in the other the other side, really not not incredibly surprising, I guess you would say. But it, it looks like uh, Billy Bowman's kind of won that job. At the nickel position, you know, certainly I know they got a little bit of, of, of time to go, but I think there's probably some tough discussions that, that have been had after the after the scrimmage. But, you know, everything that I've heard, I think Billy Bowman has won that job, which is, you know, just a testament to him, you know, coming in as a true freshman, being able to play at, at a being able to not only play but start at a critical position for for Alex Grinch's defense like like the nickelback is, is really is really big for him and, and I think Oklahoma has that depth certainly with him and Jeremiah Cordell there and I think they'll be stronger at that position that they have um, that they have in the past but I think um, you know I, I think it it's it's a good situation for Oklahoma to, to have I think you know in, in the other safety positions um, you know, Bryson Washington is a guy that probably needs to needs to solidify himself right there, um, as well. So, good questions, good discussion on the on the defensive secondary there. Um, so, back to the running back, three scholarship running backs enough. I mean, remains to be seen. I, I think it's I think it's a position that Oklahoma would like to not be in. Um, obviously, you know that 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 depth was there previously and, and you know it, it took a little bit of a hit certainly with Mikey Henderson and Seth McGowan that was I think that we all thought was going to be part of this team could provide a lot of solid depth Oklahoma ha- had the opportunity to be a little bit um, you know they had the opportunity to to mix and match those kids a little bit more um, than, than than they would hope hope so hope to but I think you when you have a guy like Trey Bradford coming in I think he has a ton of up, upside, um, and just so when he gets, I think he's got a lot of uh, he's got a lot of wiggle to him, a lot of speed that Oklahoma doesn't hasn't had in the past. So I think he's um, I think he's going to be good uh, for, for the Sooners, and they have they have a really good one two three punch. But let's let's not be the, these three scholarship running backs aren't um, aren't too shabby. I think any three of them can go, as I mentioned earlier, can go win you a championship um, this year. 
Yeah, good question. This is one of the things that I led off with with Patrick and kind of talking about what are the options for the Sooners should Oklahoma get into a depth issue where you know one of those three um, you know knock on wood don't get hurt, but if they if they do if they're out for a game or they're you know partial game or you know hopefully not multiple games, but if they did, I think your your first you know your first move is probably moving Jeremiah Hall, um, having some some depth there. Uh, moving him there, but then you also got the two walk-ons. You know, Todd Hudson um, is a good is, is a kid that will that that could possibly play. Jade Knowles is another guy um, that Jade Knowles might be a little bit more ready to play um, than uh, than than Todd Hudson. So I think Jade Knowles and uh, Jeremiah Hall are the two guys that I would think about. But, but then, then again, when you look at a kid like Jeremiah Hall, you, you take him away from the H back tight end group, which now has two, maybe three guys in itself. So I think that I think there's going to be some, if Oklahoma gets into that situation, I think there's going to be some creativity that's needed for, um, you know, for, for Oklahoma getting there. Um, so, yeah, I mean, just, same point, Ryan. Yeah, I think he'll he could end up being the guy that kind of goes there if if Oklahoma uh, finds itself finds itself in a in a depth um, issue. Um, one of the things I wanted to t- touch on is the, is the wide receiver group a little bit. So I think one of the things that was really big to hear er- early on here um, today was was that throughout the entire scrimmage, which was a 90-play scrimmage, Oklahoma did not have any drops at the wide receiver position. So I think that's big just in terms of Oklahoma leading. Oklahoma's wide receiver led – sorry, let me say that again. Oklahoma's wide receivers led the country in the and dropped touchdown passes last year with eight. So, And I think the next closest was four. So it was really a, a, as good as Marvin Mims was, as good um, – you know, even as Rambo was last year, um, you know, I know he was a little bit disappointing, but, you know, in terms of the production that Oklahoma had at the wide receiver position, you know, it certainly left a lot to be desired and a lot, a lot of meat on the bone uh, for the Sooners. So I, so I think Oklahoma feels good about who they have um, coming into the season. I think they feel good. Talked a lot about Jaden Hazelwood today. Riley did. Talked about, you know, I think the injury ha- has made him grown into – a more mature player, more mature receiver uh, for Oklahoma this year. Uh, so I think Oklahoma has probably six guys that they feel really comfortable with um, in, in that, um, you know, in that rotation. You've got, you've got a Jaden Hazelwood, you've got Mike Woods, you've got um, Marvin Mims, you've got Drake Stoops, you've got Mario Williams, um, and then you've got Theo Wee. So I think those six guys are going to be your top guys. And I think, you know, maybe Cody Jackson, um, gets into the fray a little bit, you know, as, as you look a little bit deeper. Um, Jaleel Farouk was a guy who was – Jaleel Farouk, I haven't heard a ton about him, but he was one of the stands out, standouts of the scrimmage. Um, Trevon West is another guy. So I think they got a lot of guys there that, that they're – um, that they'll have at their disposal to to play and and to run in and out. So I, I think um, I, I think he's a I think those are the guys that you will um, you will see in and out um, of that lineup. Um, Mike was he's a guy that I think I think he'll start day one. I think you know with all due respect to Theo Weiss, I think he's coming off of that ankle or lower lower body thing that he had in the spring. But I, I think Mike Woods gives you something a little bit different there, and certainly Theo Weiss will play. You know, it's it's kind of like a one A one B situation there. Um, you know, certainly. But I think Mike Woods, the body type that he has, the strength, um, the elusiveness, the deep playability. I think that he has, you know, in terms of the total package. Certainly, I don't know that he's on the level of like a CD Lamb. Um, or even like a Ryan Broyles or any, anybody like that, although he's a different type of receiver. I think he, he, he checks a lot of the boxes that you'll look at for, uh, for Oklahoma. You know, you have a guy that can, can go over the middle, can make the tough catch. You know, he can body some of those receivers, you know, kind of from a block out situation to take a turn from basketball where, um, you know, you can you can get him quick on the sidelines or he can he can blow past you. There's a lot of he had a lot of long touchdown receptions for for Arkansas. And remember, he's a guy that led the SEC in um, yard per catch last year out of all receivers. That includes the Heisman Trophy winner. So 
So you look at you look at him. Um, I think he's going to play a lot. I think he I think he's going to have a big year for Oklahoma. And remember, a thing to think about for some of these kids, um, think from a Jaden Hazelwood, a Theo Weiss, a Mike Woods. These are money years for them, right? Mike Woods um, is the sole reason he came to Oklahoma was to get more targets, get more um, kind of notoriety, uh, being a better, um, more prolific offense. So he could kind of solidify himself for the drafts. So I think in, in Jaden Hazelwood's another guy, he's, he's third year in the program, redshirt sophomore, but he's the third, he's in his third year in Oklahoma. So he's draft eligible. So if he has a good year, you could see him go. So not only do they have, do they have the, the, the moment of uh, the, you know, motivation of, having a good year, you know, for the team and individually, but, but it's, it's a money year for, for them as well um, to, to, to look at. Um, so just some conversation in the chat here about, you know, whether the, whether, whether or not Oklahoma needs a running back and whether or not they'll, they'll go um, to the, to the portal um, for, um, for that running back. You know, I don't think that Oklahoma is going to be able to, um, you know, it's too late to be able to go to the portal um, this year. And, you know, I think when you when you when you look at what they have, I think DeMarco Murray's done an excellent job in, in their recruiting for next year um, that that Oklahoma um, will look at. Uh, uh, Javante Barnes is another 2022 kid that Oklahoma could get in the, in the mix with. Um, so they got Gavin Salchuk as well. Ray Leak Brown is a little bit more of a wide, he's a wide receiver guy, kind of a, um, a running back slash wide receiver. So I think, um, you know, I think there remains to be seen. I think they got a lot of talent coming in next year. So I think they're probably in a position where they're going to have to just kind of hold on to what they have um, right now and, 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 and look and see, exactly you know how they're able to finish this season with with what they have now and you know you got you you know you've you've got kind of a back to the drawing board type of situation you know you've got two your top two running backs who are draft eligible if both of those kids have a really good year then those are two kids that you know could you could see uh leaving for the draft and you know and this a lot of this points to the reason why i think a lot of people point to this year as being the year for, for Oklahoma. And I'm certainly one of those that subscribe to that just because of, you know, we've, we've got a lot of kids on the defensive side that Oklahoma will potentially lose um, after, after this year. Certainly uh, when you, when you look at the defensive line and Isaiah Thomas, a uh, Perry on Winfrey and a Nick Benito are, are certainly three guys that will be in the NFL draft next year. So this is their, this is certainly going to be their, you know, their last year, um, so depending on you know how how the secondary shakes out, you might have some guys there. So you know they're they're extremely deep on the defensive line, and this everything points to this being the, the year that Oklahoma has the opportunity to win a win a national championship. Everything seems to have pointed to this year um, in, in terms of the roster, in terms of the schedule, in terms of you know the competition because. You know, when, when you look at the top five teams, certainly Oklahoma's in there with, um, you know, number two AP with, you know, with Alabama, with Clemson, with Georgia, with Ohio State. And when you think about it, Oklahoma is the only the only team that has a returning starter outside of Georgia there. So you got a lot of new um, new blood on the, you know, for the for the top five teams in terms of exactly what they have and in, in, in returning from a quarterback perspective. And you know, find a lot, a lot about Clemson and Georgia early on for that week one game. And, you know, so I think, so I think that's one thing that you point out. One thing that you point out is how, how much improved the defense is this year um, as well. So I think all signs point to this. So if if Oklahoma could stay healthy at the running back position, it's, it's going to be um, big, um, a, a big, you know, leading indicator to, to exactly how good of a season that Oklahoma can, can have for sure. Um, good recruiting question from Patrick here. Um, you're, you know, really talking about, um, Oklahoma's recruiting class. I think, um, 
Gabe Dindy is a is a big one um, on the on the defensive line, one of the top fifteen players in the country overall, one of the best defensive linemen um, in the country. Um, it, it seems to be between Oklahoma and Texas A and M right now. I think Oklahoma, you know, has a has a slight lead. I, I think there was some you know some news about it when his dad took that um, took that took that pastoral job in College Station. I think it was a lot of us. You know, reading into it, thought that that was just kind of the, the the writing on the wall, and and from everything I've heard lately, I, I don't necessarily think that's the case. I think he loves Oklahoma. I think Oklahoma's the, um, I think Oklahoma's the the place that he wants to be. I think his family's really kind of supporting him in that in that endeavor and, and being coming to Oklahoma. So he would be a big get um, for Oklahoma. Uh, Omri Abor is another kid from uh, from the Texas. Um, area that is big on Oklahoma, a lifetime Oklahoma fan, him specifically. So I think Oklahoma has a little bit of a leg up there. Um, I think that's a little bit closer, I think, in terms of an Oklahoma a and um, outlook there. Uh, Gentry Williams, another in-state kid, the best player in the, in the state uh, this year, uh, is another guy that's pretty big. I think it's certainly between Oklahoma and USC for him. I, I think there was some – there was some thought, you know, within a couple of months ago that he, that maybe USC led from for him. I think he's a guy that is very. If you don't know anything about Gentry Williams, he is a very a very big advocate for the state of Oklahoma. Uh, so, so I think if if Oklahoma lost him, that would be a big loss. I, I think knowing that knowing how, specifically how well Oklahoma's done, you know, over the, not historically over the last few years, but this year they've got a lot of good. Um, they secured a lot of in-state kids, not only for the 2022 class, but 2023 as well. Um, so I, I think um, I think that's those are a few guys that um, that I know that uh, that I know of that Oklahoma's in on on 22. And we'll do another. We'll we'll do one of these shows here, you know, maybe at one point during, during the year to kind of talk about 2022 and 23 recruiting. If you're not following 2023 recruiting, um, it's a little. I've always said, you know, some of the 17, 18 year old kids, you know, when you, when you look at 2023, you know, they, they've got a full two years to change their mind multiple times, but you can't ignore um, exactly what Oklahoma has been able to do um, on the 2023 circuit. They've got the number one class in the country and it's not even close. Um, I, I think, you know, when you look at a guy like um, Malachi Nelson at the quarterback position, once you secure that quarterback, a lot of the other guys will follow. You know, as we've seen, Trayon Webb is another guy, high four-star, could be uh, potentially a five-star guy. Um, Brandon Ennis is another guy that Oklahoma recently got, um, you know, over the last um, the last week. So, so I think – Oklahoma is doing a really good job. You you know you wonder how much of the SEC kind of goes into that, um, but I think you know I think they've done um, an incredibly incredible incredible job on the 2023 cycle. 2022s um, you know kind of slid down just a little bit, but I think um, I think that 2023 class is going to be um, dynamic for Oklahoma at the at the skill position as well. Uh, so let's see. Let's talk. Let's talk a little bit. So I've got some more defensive um, defensive questions and comments. Um, David Aguebu, like, he's a guy. I, I think he'll start inside. I, I think he's a guy that has to take that next step. He has to. You know, he made some good. He, he was pretty up and down last year. You know, from a consistency perspective, him and Deshaun White. You know, we're certainly certainly shared time there, but I think he's a guy that has to solidify. He has to be. You, you'd like to see him have a Kenneth Murray type of season um, for for Oklahoma this year in order for you know Oklahoma just to be that much more dynamic at the at the at the linebacker position. I think he can be, um, but I think he has to be the guy that's that that dominant inside linebacker really kind of moving, you know, moving to Ryan's question specifically. I think it's, it's a Goebu that has to be that guy. Um, you know, Deshaun white is I, everything that I've heard from him over the last couple of years. And that hasn't changed this, this fall is that he is a guy that, that, that always knows where to be. You know, he's, you know, fundamentally sound. He's one of the best linebackers that they have, you know, just, 
athletically he may not be necessarily at the level of a Danny Stutzman or necessarily at the level of a Kenneth Murray or specifically David Aguebu for this year. So, um, so yeah, I think Aguebu is the guy looking long term. Um, Danny Stutzman could be, could be that guy as well uh, from that linebacker. Um, Shane Witter is a guy that you know Brian Odom talked a lot about in his press conference this past week that. He can be a kid that plays a lot. Um, you know, not only plays a lot, but he's a, he could be a game changer for, for Oklahoma. So I think that's um, that's another guy as well to, to, to look at in terms of that, that defensive depth. Um, we've got 68, 68 in here now, so keep it coming. Love the questions, love the talk. So excited for this season, guys. I mean, I, I think that you all are as well. Um, you know, we're a week and a half away. Um you know, next Thursday I, I head to New Orleans, excited to be there. Um, you know, I know that I, I hope the, the protocols don't keep um, a lot of people away. I think it'll be a really good atmosphere. I think you'll see at least at least as many Oklahoma fans as Tulane fans there, if not more. But hope the protocols don't get to, don't get um, too many people away. So really excited about that start uh, starting game. And then you got Western Carolina. You know, as kind of a, a game that really you know has to happen from a financial perspective a lot of times, and then and then you got Nebraska, which will be, you know, obviously Nebraska is not what they were, what what they have been, and they, there's a lot of um, you know there's a big cloud surrounding their program right now with you know the news that came out last week about them you know practicing during the pandemic when they weren't really supposed to, and and you know just the looming you know issues with 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 him are. are you know, with Scott Frost in terms of, you know, is he able to get them back to a bowl game this year? So really, so we'll, um, we'll talk a little bit about Nebraska and Illinois, break that down a little bit next Saturday as well, or this Saturday, I should say. Uh, so let's see Deshaun White. I think, you know, Deshaun White's gonna, he's, he's playing a lot, Zach. So I think he'll, he'll certainly play it. Not sure what, what that start will look like, I think. Um, but I, I think, that he will certainly enter into the rotation. Don't really see. I, I think we'll see Aguebu starting, but I, I think he will definitely be part of that rotation. I think there's probably about um, another six or seven guys, uh, maybe maybe sevens pushing it a little bit. But I think you got six guys um, from a linebacker perspective that will be um, that will be shuffling in and out for um, for Oklahoma. Sooner Thrawn, thanks. Thanks for coming back again. Um, Thrawn, you a lot of good questions. Uh, last time we went live on, on Saturday. Um, very good point. I, I think, you know, I, I think they're already seeing that. So what I had heard from the from the scrimmages, you know, Eric Gray didn't get a ton of ton of time. He played a little bit, but they almost they almost completely didn't even touch Kennedy Brooks. So I think what you're gonna see throughout the year is they're going to um, they're going to do everything that they can to they're going to do everything they can to keep those three guys healthy. Um, certainly don't know their vaccination status, so I would assume that Kennedy Brooks is vaccinated based on his opt out last year. But hopefully that doesn't enter into uh, into into the fray for 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 those three kids this year. But yeah, they'll do everything to keep them um, to keep them um, healthy. Yes, Jimmy. Absolutely, that's a good point. He is visiting. I couldn't remember if it was the fourth or the eleventh, but yes, he's visiting for Nebraska. Um, and you know, I think that's. And again, you know, we've talked a lot about that in here in terms of what that Nebraska game and the eleven a.m. And you know, it's a, a good segue into the next question. But um, it's tough for some of those kids to to be able to play a game on Friday night and still be available um, to um, be available to go to go to a, to a, to a college campus again, Saturday morning. So, but yeah, I think Dindy's visiting September 11th for the Nebraska game is, is everything. I'm sorry. I, I've got my days mixed up. So September 11th is Western Carolina. So yeah, I, I do think he's visiting for Western Carolina. I think originally he was, he was looking at, you know, coming in for the Nebraska game, but based on that 11 AM, um, you know, kickoff, I think it's really just hard for some of those players to do that. Um, so Zachary, good question. Do you think the OU will be playing the SEC next year? I do. I, I, I do. I, I think, you know, I, I think worst case 2023. Um, but 
I think all signs are pointing to 2022. You know, we've, we've talked about, you know, you, we, one of the big news today was the, the scheduling alliance between the ACC, the, you know, the PAC 12 and the big 10, which was a really, it was a big announcement about nothing, you know, about them doing a scheduling alliance and they're, they're going to honor a lot of the, the, the existing contracts. So that's like way, way down the road. I think that you, that you look at that, but I think that was more of a play to, um, to, combat um the the balance of power that that would that the sec is going to have with with texas and oklahoma um you know going into the to the sec but i but i think one way or the other that you'll see oklahoma and texas competing um in the sec next year whether you know whether you look at it from 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 the from the side of Oklahoma is going to and Texas are going to have to pay that you know the eighty million each or you know the Big Twelve you know kind of dissipates one of the, one of those things I think will happen where where Oklahoma and Texas will play in the SEC in twenty twenty two and and so now it's kind of from a scheduling perspective what does that look like does Oklahoma if uh, the twenty twenty two thing really happens what what does that what does that look like does um, does Oklahoma stop playing Oklahoma State next year? Is this the last bedlam um, game that we see for you know for the for the next couple next few years or the next? And then what does that do? We see divisions for um, you know for Oklahoma um, and Texas in the SEC, or do we have that pod system? You know, I think I think that there's a more um, I think it's more advantageous advantageous for the pod uh, system in itself. Right there, when you look at you know maybe Oklahoma and Texas and um, Missouri and Arkansas, you know being in a being in a pod, you know you have you know, you know you have that regional look there. But um, yeah, I, I would think if if I was a betting guy, if you if you stuck a gun to my head right now and asked me to pick, I think Oklahoma and Texas will be in the in the SEC in 2022, but absolutely no later than than 2023. Um, so I think it's just a waiting game right now on, on which I think Oklahoma and the SEC and, and maybe even Texas from a Longhorn Network perspective is ready to pull that um, proverbial trigger whenever whenever they can or whenever they're ready. But I think um, I think it, it'll happen one way or the other, whether Oklahoma and Texas get out there, get out scot free or whether, um, you know, whether the big tw- or whether they have to given um some of that money keep in mind that i I believe texas still has 10 more years on the deal that espn owes them 15 million per year so you know there's been some thoughts that you know kind of under the table that texas is you know is going to play um is going to pay you know both oklahoma and texas's way to get out of the conference early so if that's the case they've got that in their back pocket and i think the big 12 and the sec knows that as well um so i think that's um, you know, I think that's something to, to think about when you look at look at when Oklahoma and Texas might go to go and start playing in the SEC. Um, defensive philosophy. So that's a, that's a really good question, um, Ryan. And I really I really haven't even even thought of that. I, I think to a to a certain extent. And I think over the past few years, it's kind of been you've kind of played based on how long you've been in the program. So like seniors were rewarded, like, or the guys that played last year, you, you know, maybe they weren't necessarily the the best players, but they played. And I think Grinch has a, has a much different philosophy in terms of, you know, you cer- certainly kind of earn your keep type of mentality in turn and specifically those guys that have, you know, I mean, a good, a good indicator is a guy like Key Lawrence first year in the program, a guy like Billy Bowman, you know, first year in the program, you know, a guy, when you even t- talk about Jalen Redmond coming back, you know, those guys are probably going to start, um, you know, that we, that, that you have. So I think not only that, but the idea that they've got so much solid quality depth that they feel comfortable playing a lot of those guys, it, it does nothing but help, um, help the recruiting uh, for, um, for Oklahoma, just to know that as a true freshman, you, you have ability to, uh, you have the ability to play immediately, um, you know, at whatever position that might be, defensive line, linebacker, or, or in the secondary. You you have that, you know, you have that ability to come in and, and play uh, immediately. 
Um, another comment by Zach. No, yeah, absolutely. I think he's a guy that played really well down the stretch, got a lot of playing time, you know, towards the last, you know, five, six games of the year, obviously started that uh, the Cotton Bowl um, with, with Trey Brown, you know, kind of holding out for the draft. So played well in that game. Obviously, I think one of the things that, that I've seen and heard that through um, through fall practice, they, they throw away – away from him a lot and i think you've seen some of those videos where you've seen him make a couple of really good pass breakups and and good um one-handed interceptions so the things that i've heard not specifically dj green but he's in that mold you know with a latrell mccutcheon the Jaden davis a, a woody washington you'll have periods of just spectacular off the chart plays and then you'll have periods of just just average just okay so so i think as camp has rolled on you know getting that getting more consistent in it and i think they've got a lot of guys that can do it so you know i think you know one of the things you know that's part of the recruiting thought process as well but just specifically playing each and every each and every down each and every week knowing that hey if i don't bring it every single snap i've got someone you know crawling on my heels to to be able to play and you know the I've got a coaching staff that's not going to be hesitant to play those guys. So, um, so I think that's really big um, in terms of understanding that, you know, some of these kids, they don't have, you know, even a minute to, um, to breathe at all. Um, Jimmy, absolutely. Harrington will be in the, in the rotation at cornerback. I, you know, wouldn't be surprised at all to see him start, um, go out there and start against Tulane. Um, certainly he'll be in the two deep, you know, he, uh, Roy Manning talked a lot about his question was a question that was posed to him. Is, is he a safety or a cornerback? And, you know, Roy Manning answered the question by saying yes. So I, I, I think, I think he's primarily been working at, at cornerback and, you know, they certainly could move him around, you know, at, at a nickel at a safety position as well and be a little bit more creative there. Um, but I think he's definitely a cornerback. I think he's got the speed, he's got the athleticism and he absolutely has the height that Alex Grinch and, and Manning in the back end are looking for. So I think he's a cornerback right now. Wouldn't at all be surprised to see him with the ones and I've heard that he's had an excellent, um, excellent camp so far. Is there a character problem um, at Oklahoma? So, you know, I was, I've, I'd heard a lot of that commentary specifically. You know, I think Riley has dealt with that this year, maybe more than more than anything, uh, more than any year that he's had with the uh, with the Mikey Henderson, with the Trajan Bridges, with the um, Seth McGowan. You know, maybe to a certain extent, a couple years ago with the uh, with the guy that got suspended in the LSU game, but. I, I don't necessarily think that, that I would say there's an overall program character problem based on the based on the actions of a few. You know, you, you've got to understand, I think a lot of people will throw try to throw Lincoln Riley under the bus to a certain extent, but you gotta understand that he can't he can't be responsible for these kids twenty four seven. You know, they, they they they've got at some point to be an adult. You know, you're you're an eighteen year old kid, you you know You've got to be able to know the difference between right and wrong um, at this point in your life. So he's, you know, he does the best that he can, but he's not he's not responsible for babysitting these kids at all. So I don't think Oklahoma has a character problem. Certainly, there might be some kids that um, that kind of went off the beaten path, so to speak, and really, you know, just made terrible decisions. But I, I don't think overall, you know, you have a you you really have a character um, problem at Oklahoma right now. Nothing that I would say. So um, we're about an hour in. So thanks everybody for joining. A um, lot of good comments, a um, lot of good questions. Um, I'll make sure that the notification stuff is working appropriately. If, if for some reason anyone didn't get, didn't get notified that we were going live, we will go live um, on Saturday. We'll do another precursor to our, um, our weekly um, Saturday coverage. Um, so we'll, you know, mostly just we can sit around and watch football and talk um, and talk about some of the some of the games that are that are happening um, live. So we'll probably do it around eleven noon time. So we've got um, you know we've got the college game day preview show that starts um, starts kicks off the season for ESPN. You know at eight a.m. eight to eleven, and then um, at noon you, we've got Nat, Nebraska and Illinois um, that starts, and then later in the later in the day at two thirty Hawaii and UCLA. So we'll talk about those games a little bit. 
you know, talk about anything that comes up between now and then recruiting fall camp, um, any, anything that I have, you know, for the next few days, we'll, we'll talk through that, um, talk through that as well. So join us at Oklahoma live, Oklahoma football live. Um, also I'll put up a poll. Um, want to kind of get your ideas, um, on what kind of a name that you're, this is your show. Um, happy to be here for you guys and enjoy talking Oklahoma football. This is your show. want to get into, you know, exactly what you, you know, what you look, look for, um, in terms of what a name, um, name for our show, we'll, we'll come up with something good, um, as opposed to Oklahoma football live. Not that that's not great, but just something more tailored to a, to a post game show. So, uh, thanks everybody for joining in. Um, we'll, we'll send out some notifications in terms of when we're going to go live on Saturday, but expect that to be at about 11 AM, um, central time, unless something changes, but, um, look forward to talking football with you guys. Thanks.